1982, Santa Monica, California. John Marino, Lon Holdeman, John Howard, Michael Shermer. Four men push away from the pier on road bikes. 3,000 miles of America's most arduous, most unrelenting conditions imaginable await them. These road warriors no one knows are pioneers, iron men of the nth degree. They race like men possessed for reasons they could not measure, not for a cereal box cover or a dime of prize money. They race toward a finish line they can only imagine for the reward of finishing pure and simple. Ultra marathon cycling was born that day, an original, unique brand of extreme sports. Race Across America slapped the psyche of America like an outrageous dare. It can't be done. And if it can, why would you want to? In this special hour-long program, Race Across America, the history of RAN analyzes unfathomable efforts of human endeavor made real mile after mile. From 1982 Santa Monica to New York City inauguration to 2002's Portland to Pensacola 20th anniversary, Preparations are now in full swing for the 2003 Race Across America, a diversely challenging course from the harbor at San Diego Bay to the famous boardwalk in Atlantic City. Two decades of Ram memories are celebrated by ultra-marathon cycling legend Lon Haldeman. Haldeman was the Ram champion in 1982 and 83. Through 20 races in 20 years, a select number of world-class cyclists have attempted what Outdoor Magazine calls the world's toughest race. Every year, amazing stories of speed, strength, and stamina are written. Stories of life at its fullest. The story of a Vietnam soldier turned amputee turned cycling warrior. The story of a quiet man with thunderous achievements. Of remarkable women athletes. Of modest resources producing awesome results. And of the abandon of teenagers competing at very adult endeavors. After 20 years, Race Across America still defies understanding. So many try to define, quantify, and compare this race. The elements are clear enough. The course is continuous. The clock is always running. No set stages like the Tour de France. Just America at its most open, most beautiful, and impossible best. If you must have a definition, think of Race Across America as a 300-mile cycling marathon. Ten of them, back to back. Race Across America, the history of Ram is next. Welcome to Race Across America, the first 20 years. I'm Scott Johnson. When you talk about ultra-marathon cycling in America, there's one man you got to talk to. The race director for Race Across America, ultra-marathon cycling legend, Lon Haldeman. Lon, thanks for being with us today. This is exciting, 20 years of RAM. It's hard to believe. It's gone by pretty fast. Yes, it has. Uh, in fact, uh, some of my best recollections are, are some of those earliest races, and so it'll be fun to talk about those. 24 days, 2 hours, 34 minutes. I, I, I can't even believe it in talking about it. Double transcontinental race. New York to Los Angeles, from Los Angeles back to New York. What was the motivation to try that one? Well, actually, uh, John Marino had... Uh, set the record uh, back in 1978, 1979, 1980. John Marino was really the, the father of the modern movement towards ultramarathon cyclists. Although people have been racing across the country ever since uh, the 1870s on high wheel bicycles following the railroad routes across the country. And every year, the, every 10 years or so, the, the record would get a few days less. John was instrumental in my development because I was getting interested in long distance cycling and here, and here for three years in 78, 79, and 80, you know, here John was going out doing these uh, races, uh, solo record attempts across the country because there was no race across America at that time. So he was my, my motivation and, and somebody who personified what was possible. And for him to be going out there and doing that, it was like, yeah, I, I think I would like to do that. Well, John had uh, set the record. Uh, back around, uh, it was around 12 days and, uh, in 1980. And so I got the idea, well, let's, let's see if we can break that record across the country. So we plotted and plotted how we were going to go about it. And I remember my dad and I just having this conversation like, well, I think we can break 12 days across the country, but we've gone through all this work with all the routing. Let's see if we can do the double transcontinental, which at the time the record was 36 days. So. Our goal going into it was to do something less than 30 days, 
for the round trip, but also break the one-way record, which was around 12 days. Next, it was lights, camera, action. As 1982 and the Great American Bike Race would take the national stage. That's next on Race Across America, the history of rain. Welcome back to Race Across America, the history of RAM. The other heroes of the first race was the Great American Bike Race in 1982, John Howard and Michael Sherman. Let's take John first. What kind of character was John? Well, John had uh, been a very successful national level road racing cyclist, um, uh, you know, from when he was, you know, after high school all the way through. So he had been oh, maybe almost 15 years as a national icon for road racing cycling, a multiple national uh, time road racing champion. And he had also got into triathletes at the t triathlons at the time, which, you know, people are thinking, what is a triathlon? You know, this is back in the beginning even of that sport. And John was very successful at that, had just won the Ironman triathlon. So uh, he was coming from a road racing background in a triathlon background getting involved in long distance cycling. Michael Shermer, it turned out, was a good personal friend of John Marino's and I think Michael got involved because he had interviewed John Marino for a magazine article, got involved talking with John about the history of marathon cycling, wanted to, to do more of it, and so, so Michael had set a record from Seattle to San Diego, uh, some 1,500 miles or so, and had proved himself as a very capable endurance cyclist and so that's kind of how the next step of the great american bike race came to be is john marino as as a record holder john howard as a, a iron man winner michael Shermer as a as a record holder and then myself as the double transcontinental record holder who had actually had beaten john marino's one-way record also um, and that's how the four of us became involved in the race it's 1982 santa monica pier four men and 3,000 miles to go. What was your strategy, Lon? Because you got out of the gates and you didn't look back. You were very aggressive in 82. What was the strategy going into that race? Well, I guess the one thing that I had that the other riders didn't is I already had the double transcontinental under my belt from the year before. So I had those two transcontinental races at a very good speed. Also, my wife Susan had just set the woman's transcontinental record one month before the Great American Bike Race. And one of the things that she did during that was able to ride all day, all night into the next day and prove that it was possible. Which previous to that, like I say, is we're back in the days when you didn't ride at night that much. And so the typical mentality was you, you put in your 200 miles, 250 miles during daylight, get a good night's sleep, get up and race again. Susan showed that you could go all day and all night and in, in all day and, and get by on a lot less sleep and, and, and still have a good time of, uh, as far as speed across the country. So had she not done that a month before the race, I don't know if I would have thought it was possible. And so what happened at the start of the Great American Bike Race is I had ridden uh, the first 400 miles or so in through the, the first night uh, and then was off the bike for just an hour or so and then continued on about another uh, two or three or hundred miles or so the next day and that allowed me to open up I don't know whether it was a five or a six hour lead or so and I was able to gain a little bit of that all the way across the country. The 1982 race in the record books and the beginning of history on two wheels was well on its way. More of the history of Race Across America coming up next. Welcome back to Race Across America, the history of RAM, as we look back at the early days of the ultimate cycling challenge. Because of the covering of the event by ABC's Wild World of Sports and a tremendous sponsorship package by McDonald's Corporation, a lot of people found out about the Great American Bike Race. A name change ensued, Race Across America for 83. And something else started. John Marino started the John Marino Open, and this was a, an opportunity for cyclists to get these openings in RAM. Tell us to this day, Lon, there are qualifying races for Race Across America. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the reason for the solo division to have the qualifying events was to make sure that people were physically able to do the Race Across America. Uh, a lot of people would maybe see the show on television and say, gee, I'd like to do that. Uh, the, the other thing, part of that, is the reality of actually being able to do it. And so we've st started a series of qualifying events ar around the country for people to go out and uh, 
typically it was uh, the men had to do 425 miles in 24 hours or about equivalent of that speed. The women had to do about 400 miles. And that was based on the, the history of the race across America of what physically was uh, required to, to do well in the race, maybe not win the race, but at least uh, be a competitor in, in contention. Were you surprised arriving at the Tropicana in Atlantic City that you had won championships back to back in 82 and 83? Uh, well, you know, on one hand, you know, yes, being, being surprised, being grateful, uh, whatever. Uh, I didn't think that I had even ridden my, my best races. Uh, but for me, you know, winning wasn't, was, was a goal, but it wasn't, it was the process. It was the six months before the race, the year before the race, the, the whole event across the country. That's what was the thrill and the motivation for me. So I think if you look back on those finish line uh, things of me, you don't really see a lot of uh, champagne and jubilation and things. It's like, okay, we're here, we did it. Uh, and that was just part of the process. And I think that's the philosophy that I have had ever since then. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, winning is, winning is the goal, but it's, it's only just a small part of the overall picture. There are so many things that happen to a rider during the course of the race. Physical, emotional breakdowns. In 84, you experienced blurry vision. At that time, you didn't really know what was going on. It actually took years later to actually figure out that may have been the start of something more serious for you. Yes, and as, as it turns out, it was, uh, was a, um, like a thyroid condition that I've had ever since sophomore in high school. And uh, because of misdiagnosis and, and various things, uh, I look back on my career as, uh, you know, sometimes it was very, very, it was almost maybe a benefit, I mean, to be a little hyperthyroid and not sleep all night. And other times, you know, the, the pendulum would swing the other way. And so I was always dealing with that, even though I, I didn't know what the problem was. And so it's only been till recently that we've we've been able to to figure that out, and you know that I look back on the '84 race, uh, and you know I definitely was was dealing with a lot of those those problems during during that event, uh, but that's the way it was. You know. People really don't know how to take race across America. Sometimes that if they're not a competitor themselves, people like John Howard and Jonathan Boyer, the 1985 champion, kind of outspoken about the race across America and. How did their opinion of the race change from before they raced till after they raced? I think after you've been involved in something like like Ram, maybe even as a competitor or even as a, as a crew member or something, uh, the magnitude of going coast to coast across the country really starts to set in. And the thing is to remember that Race Across America is the world's longest time trial. And, and you might start off as a a very high fast mile per hour speed uh, and then you start to extrapolate well what does it mean to 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 maintain that pace over days and days and days and the, and the things that you have to deal with and if you take that into perspective you you understand that okay you are going to be out there on the bike for for hours and hours at a time you are going to be riding at night you are going to be dealing with uh, the best way to get across Indianapolis traffic uh, you are going to be dealing with the winds and the rain and, and all the things that go into uh, what you would see across the United States. And so for somebody like you know, John Howard and Jonathan Boyer, I think they understood a lot more of that as the race progressed and they were out there day and night uh, through all types of weather conditions. And when they reached the end of the race, I think they found out that there was a lot more to it than maybe what they originally thought. P. Penzier is a competitor, of course, in the early days, uh, eventually a partner for you. He put in a tremendous performance in 1986, uh, finishing the race in eight days, nine hours, and 42 minutes. We talked about it off camera. It was a fast route, but really a, a blistering performance, 15.40 miles per hour. He really dominated that year. Yes, and, and Pete brought something special to the race because he was a technician of what it would take. You know, he looked at all phases of the race, equipment-wise. He went through every part of the bicycle and what could be done better, how, how to be more comfortable on the, on the, the bike, using uh, aero bars and, and things uh, to, to improve uh, upper body comfort, what could be done better for the saddle position. And, and he looked at everything. He, and he looked at nutrition. Uh, the first one to really get a good nutritional program dialed in. And those type of things all contributed to Pete having a spectacular race. Plus, mentally, 
he was very, very focused. Respect for the race was growing, as was the field of competitors. We'll meet more of them when Race Across America, the history of Ram, continues. 1987 was year five for Race Across America, and the field of competitors was growing, American racers and racers from around the world. Austrian Franz Billauer placed third in 1987. What are the role of European champions coming over here and tackling the Race Across America? That's grown over the years. Well, I think for a lot of Europeans, the, the United States is just this huge country, and uh, most of the countries in Europe could have been traveled in just a, a couple days by the bike, but to be able to race across for 10 days, you know, uh, was was a very uh, good challenge for people. And the Europeans would like to come over here and, and experience it. And it was the land of cowboys and Indians. And, you know, to go across to, uh, the, the whole country. So that's why uh, I think there was this whole mystique in Europe uh, about these, these riders wanting to come over and experience that, what it would be like to cross such a vast country. Michael Seacrest of Flint, Michigan uh, was a champion in 87. He was trailed by Michael Trail and he came in about two and a half hours ahead of him. Uh, Michael is a character. Uh, how would you describe his competitive nature? Well, Michael's, you know, very focused uh, and uh, just a great personality of the race and uh, it was always entertaining to, to have him involved because of his intensity and you, you could always uh, expect him to be among the leaders. He was uh, just a, you know, a great athlete, uh, probably one of the, the fastest, best all-around riders you know, to, to be in the Race Across America and, and had great endurance and great focus and uh, was just always a great champion. In a new wrinkle of ultramarathon cycling, tandem racing came in vogue in 1987. Tremendous performance by you and Pete Penziers. Seven days, 14 hours and 52 minutes. That's scorching. The thing about tandem racing is it's, it's maybe faster on shorter distances, but if you think about it, the longer you're out there together, the more chance there is for uh, things to go wrong with two people. Knees to get sore, saddles to get sore, attitudes to not uh, get along. So that type of thing typically made tandems slower across the country. And that's why I think when Pete and I look back on that 87 ride, is probably the most focused that either of us had been. Even I think Pete ranks at a better performance than what he had done during 86 when he set that, set that 15 mile an hour uh, Ram speed record. Uh, on the tandem we averaged about 383 miles a day uh, and everything was just in sync. Uh, equipment wise, diet wise, mentality wise and, and physical and so everything clicked. In the late 80s human powered vehicles, tandem racing, relay racing him invoke. For someone who just thinks that the race across America as a solo position is just mind-boggling, does is the relay racing, the tandem racing, and these human-powered vehicles, is this another more palatable option for these folks? Well, on a team, the, the philosophy was is to always keep somebody in motion, and it was kind of a tag team Podium Express style format where a rider would ride really, really fast for maybe one hour or so at a time, 30 minutes, and then a new rider would take over and they would just keep this evolution going. And so if somebody was resting, the other person was riding. And that opened up the race to a, a whole different attitude of riders. Maybe somebody who didn't want to do uh, something nonstop across the country, but they could go out there with, with some other riders and ride at a very intense level across the country, get some rest, recover, and then get back on that bike and really hammer. Very competitive race in 1990, Bob Forney of Denver just edging out Port Orange of Florida's Rob Kish. This was a combination, this Bob and Rob show, that we were going to see a lot in 1990. That was the first time, very competitive. What was Bob and Rob's unique struggle there against each other? Well, this is uh, the whole emergence of a, of a more competitive field. You know, back in the early days, the, the splits between riders were maybe five, six hours or so. Now the riders were separated by, by minutes and in just a few hours and so the races were just so close you know the, the the field was becoming more and more competitive you had 10 people going into the race who could win and so you had those 10 people in close proximity all across the country so the the races were much more competitive uh from from that standpoint 
and with with Bob and Rob and, and, and the, the riders that would come later, uh, th those those were those were great races. You never knew who was going to win. When you talk about a close finish between Bob Forney and Rob Kish of an hour and a half over a, a three thousand mile race, how do you put that into perspective? Three thousand miles and yet they're only separated by an hour and a half. Well, you're talking of less than one percent. So if you're going to say uh, in a hundred yard dash, you're talking. Uh, riders coming in within a chest of each other you know across the finish line and that's how competitive the field was getting is you just had these uh, a group a cluster of riders you know just within uh, hours of each other all the way across the country Bob Forney and Rob Kish would continue their individual battles and would dominate the race across America in the early 1990s details next on the history of Ram the new decade of ultra-marathon cycling was in full stride in 1991 with known leaders and new challengers. The Thunder from Down Under, Jerry Tatchery of Australia, quite a character, came in third in 1991. When you look at Jerry versus a, a Rob Kish, someone like yourself, a little less flamboyant, how do, you, how do you describe what it takes to become a champion? It's really all kinds of people. Yes, I think if you look at the, the type of riders who've won RAM um, you know, throughout, th throughout history, there's quite a variety of personalities, uh, even economic backgrounds, uh, different things. And so they're not just, you, you can't just say they're crazy, eccentric type of people, although everybody probably has their own uh, uh, unique uh, personality traits. And Jerry was uh, just a, a very outgoing person. You know, I met him for the first time. He was at the Midwest Qualifiers where, where I met him. And, and he's very resourceful, usually was able to do the race on a minimum of sponsorship and be very competitive. And that kind of became Jerry's trademark, is being a minimalist and getting across the country uh, and winning the race uh, several times. Your tandem fortunes improved in 1992 with your partner, Dr. Bob Breedlove of Iowa. Great performance, a record that still stands today, eight days, eight hours, eight minutes. How was the journey that year? Oh, it was, it was very intense. You know, and Bob had actually broke my double transcontinental record, and he's, he set a new record in 1989. He had done well in Ram uh, for several years, and we decided let's team up and do a tandem record together. And that was a good adventure for both of us, and uh, very intense. It was. Uh, I just remember how hot it was that year on that route uh, going across over into Savannah. Uh, but we're, uh, we thought, well, maybe we could go faster. We were trying to break eight days. Uh, came in at eight days, eight hours. Uh, I guess uh, in hindsight, you know, ten years later, that record still stands. Uh, so uh, it was a good race for both of us. Talk about intestinal fortitude. Seven times was a charm for Rob Kish. On his seventh attempt, he wins Ram with a record time of eight days, three hours, and 11 minutes. Rob is quite a warrior and, and a great, great record for him that year. Yes, and uh, that had a, had a, like you say, it was a, it was a very hot year. Uh, uh, just, it just seemed like it was 100 degrees all the time. And uh, for Rob to, to pull off that type of a, of a time, you know, eight days, three hours under those conditions was a great accomplishment for him. 1993 didn't get any easier. Out of 20 solo competitors, only five finished. At the start, you know, when you're leaving from Southern California and going out across the desert, uh, if you're not just able to get through that first 36 hours, uh, if you get sick, it takes you days to recover afterwards. And even though you're, you're riding at half speed, you know, uh, you get further and further behind. And I think maybe that's what caused some people to drop out that year. Uh, the, the key was is to get through the, through the heat, feel strong, and, and keep up a fairly good pace till the finish. The Race Across America, of course, brings people through a, a myriad of environmental issues, atmosphere, weather. How does a racer deal with the oppressive heat they are going to face during the race? Well, first of all, I think the better shape you're in, the, the easier it is to handle the heat conditions. The other thing is you've got a crew and that's what's really going to get people across the desert uh, by uh, being able to, to, to keep the rider uh, hydrated by, by drinking, um, by keeping their, their clothing damp, uh, things like that are just so important for getting uh, through the desert until you can get uh, through that first, uh, in, into the first night and through the first night. And then even later on in the race when you've got the humidity of the, the, the southeastern states going in across to Georgia and to Savannah and things, uh, 
it's just uh, so sapping to, to ride under those conditions. Shauna Hogan of San Jose, California in 1994 beat a record many thought would not be broken. Fantastic performance of nine days, eight hours, and 54 minutes. That's beating the record that Susan had placed by nearly 15 minutes. Uh, describe the kind of effort that Shauna Hogan put in that year and subsequent years. Well, Shauna became the uh, the dominant woman racer of the 1990s and she had gone to win ram many more times you know she had she had the physical strength she had the mental attitude and she had the, the crew and, and the focus and everything and that's what made uh, shauna such a, a great uh, champion rob kish in 1994 does it again his second championship back to back but on the horizon something new for him to chew on Details coming up next on Race Across America, the first 20 years. As the popularity of team events grew, Race Across America began to see some outstanding performances in the early 1990s. Age continues to become a factor for Race Across America. It's, it, it's unusual to me, and I'm sure you have an insight on it. So many champions, whether it be in the solo division or team divisions, are men and women approaching 40, if not older than 40? How can you accommodate that? How can you, how can you explain that so many 40-plus competitors are winning RAM? Well, I think it, it's been proven from um, from a physical standpoint that uh, that even even for shorter distance, some of the times that are turned by the 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds and things are as fast, if not faster, than some by the 20-year-olds. And for endurance sports, it seems that the older riders handled it better now, whether it becomes physiology, uh, lag strength, muscle strength things, but then also the attitude, uh, the patience, the perseverance uh, to, to, to keep it up, you know, and, uh, and especially in an event like RAM that can be so mentally draining, I think the older riders tend to handle that better. And also the thing of, I think for some older riders, it's, not, it's a now or never attitude. When they finally get to the uh, starting line of RAM, they know they might not ever get that chance again. And I see that quite a bit as like, okay, this is going to be our last time we ever get a chance to do this. We better let it all hang out. Where maybe some of the younger riders think, well, if I don't win this year, I'll just try my best and I'll do see what happens. Where the older riders know they can't do that. If they're going to win, it has to be that year because they don't get a second chance. One of the competitors in 1996 is definitely a man that we can talk about when you talk about Race Across America and the entire ultra marathon cycling world. And that's John Hughes. What part does John play in the, in the evolution and the, the present day of Race Across America? Well, see, and John got involved in long distance cycling even before it was a sport, you know, back in, in the 1970s. So he's, he's been around since uh, it was really as before there was a RAM, before there was an accepted way of, of racing across the country. And so John took over the, the directorship of the Ultramarathon Cycling Association uh, you know, as, as an editor of the magazine, as an organizer of, of the sport. And it's, it's people like John and, and hundreds of others that have crewed and things for the riders. Those are the people, the, the backbone of the sport that helps it develop and, and keeps it going uh, the way it is today. The Ultra Marathon Cycling Association is an organization with auspices over more than just the Race Across America. Tell me a little bit about this organization and all that it's involved in. Well, the UMCA, as it's known among most of the riders, has a membership of around uh, 1,200 people. And what the UMCA is involved in is uh, promoting and uh, organizing and documenting uh, the events uh, across the United States and actually even around the world. So uh, I think on the calendar now there's several hundred e events uh, where hundreds of participants can be involved in all across the country. And so they also take care of the, the rules, the, the documentation of record attempts and the, the membership and also developmentally getting new riders involved in the sport and uh, up to the level where they can participate in the Race Across America or many of the other 24-hour events across the country. Danny Chu of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the champion of Race Across America in 1996. I gotta tell you, Lon, this guy is a character. He is a self-described obsessive compulsive exerciser. He's a lot of fun, and I think he's a good thing for Race Across America, too. Yes, and, and the thing is, uh, Danny is a, a very good road racer. I, I believe he was involved in the U.S. Pro Championships, uh, did very well. 
uh, just a, a physically a very strong rider and uh, the type of person that uh, excels at an event like Race Across America. He loves riding his bike ever since uh, he was just a, a small boy. I mean, it was, the focus was to go out and ride his bike. And you really have to have that passion if you're going to do well in Race Across America. In 1998, solo racer Harold Treese was 11th. And this is someone who continued his involvement with Race Across America, not only as a competitor, but now as an official. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Treese family and uh, the other officials of Race Across America. Well, you know, Harold and his, his wife are uh, both uh, PhDs, you know, I mean, just a, you know, great, uh, a great bunch of people. And uh, they got involved in the sport again on a, on a grassroots level, uh, working their way up as, as cyclists and, and Harold to be competing in, in RAM. And uh, he wanted to get involved and, and help as, as through the officials. And that's kind of the... How, how a lot of the participants uh, in the race, uh, the staff evolves is because uh, they were riders or crew members and they learned the race from the inside out and that, that helps us a lot to have that grassroots support. Many special people put their energy and expertise into supporting Race Across America. Find out more about how you can help by visiting www.raceacrossamerica.org and stay tuned. More of the history of RAMP coming up next. Unlike 1982 when four men carried the mantle for transcontinental racing, the fields in the late 90s were big and very competitive. In 1999, five racers came in within 16 hours of each other. This is very uh, bunched up as far as Race Across America is concerned. What goes through the psyche of a racer who's embroiled in, in that kind of close competition compared to, say, a, a blowaway victory like you had in the early 80s? What, what goes through the mind in, in, the, in a close race like that? Well, I think uh, having people close to you makes you makes you want to go faster. I mean, you're watching people, you're you're looking at the time splits and things. But there again, um, I can think back on the when I was racing, and we had no perspective that a 12-hour uh, lead was was that significant. And I remember just being in a panic when when the 12-hour lead went to 11 and a half. Um, and so I can't say that. Uh, uh, that that these that these close races push people any harder, uh, but it's it's just so much more exciting to be out on the road and seeing other crews and seeing other riders. And from that standpoint, it just makes the race that much more fun to be a competitor. Well, he munched up the course, and Danny Chu won his second championship in 1999. That was a significant year because that was the year Michael Shermer stepped down as race director. And this is someone, Lon, who's given so much to the sport and ultra marathon cycling and to race across America in particular. Well, the thing what was important with Michael is that he was able to, to keep the race alive and keep it interesting at a time when there really wasn't uh, may, maybe great sponsorship. There were, there were a lot of uh, frustrations that he had to deal with on a daily basis. And, and that's to, to Michael's credit to be able to pull those races off and, and at the quality that he did uh, is, a, is a tribute to him. I want to talk to you about in 2000 because this is a big change. This is the year that Lon Haldeman became the director of Race Across America. One of the first things you did, Lon, was change the course. What was the thinking of the course change for you in 2000? Well, up to that point, the, the race had always begun in, in California, Southern California or San Francisco. And uh, I thought the race should be exposed to all parts of the country. So we started in Portland, Oregon, and we actually had a route that went diagonally across the United States down to Gulf Breeze, Florida. A very dominant performance in 2000 by Austria's Wolfgang Fasching. He beat Danny Chu by 30 hours, Lon. Uh, he must have been possessed that year. Yes, and, and what was impressive about the start of from, from Portland, during the first 500 miles, he completed that in just a little over 24 hours, which uh, set an all-time 24-hour record for the start of RAM at uh, maybe 470 miles or so he went that year, uh, through some very difficult terrain, as opposed to other years, even though we thought we had some nice fast starts leaving Southern California, to do 430, 440 miles was, was unbelievable. And for, for Wolfgang to go out and, and, and blow that record away uh, through some of the more mountainous parts of the route was just an unbelievable performance. One of the most impressive performances of 2001 clearly had to be the performance of Alaska's Peter Leakish. At 60 years old, he endured more than the 3,000 miles 
infected lungs, put him in the hospital in Wyoming for 12 hours. Still, he got back on the bike and set a record for 60 plus. What about Peter's performance? Yes, and, and Peter is a good example of, of the riders, uh, you know, to be a 60 year old. And, and, that's, and that's a very competitive uh, group of people. Uh, and that proves that uh, being 60 years old, you can still go out and do something extremely physical. And for, for Peter to go through there and, uh, you know, average uh, 250 miles a day or so, uh, just, a, just a great accomplishment. And uh, you know, Peter had a great race that year. Unfortunately, accidents have played a part in Race Across America's history, most notably Wayne Phillips of Canada in 1985. Authorities think he was purposely run over by a truck as he was traveling down the highway. He's permanently paralyzed now, and since that time, uh, competitors have to use teams now in accompanying vehicles. Uh, last year there was a scare also with uh, Angelica Castaneda, part of the twin team, when a car cut in front of her and she toppled over it. That could have been a scary moment. What are, what are some of the health concerns and, and safety concerns for racers of RAM? Well, we look at that very carefully, you know, as far as choosing the route, the roads we ride on, uh, working with the police uh, authorities, uh, letting, letting them know that the race is coming through, they're out there patrolling the route, and also the, uh, the safety aspects we have with the vehicles, uh, extra lighting and signage and, and everything that goes into to running a safer race as possible. So, you know, year after year, mile after mile, Race Across America probably has less uh, skin, knees, or elbows than, than almost any other cycling event. But uh, we're, we're fortunate that we have uh, such a good caliber of riders, and that's, uh, that helps us out also. In 2002, Inside Race Across America celebrated its 20th anniversary, filled with many compelling stories. As you look back on it, so many great stories. Wolfgang Foshing coming here, attempting to break the eight-day mark, a course that he found very, very difficult. Alan Larson, Rob Kish completing his 17th victory. The tandem, so many great stories. For you, what were some of the highlights? Well, I think just to, to be involved, seeing the riders um, uh, having the challenges, but also having a good time. And that's uh, in so many individual stories, uh, you know, maybe, there weren't too many records set this year, but there were a lot of experiences. And as people go back home, you know, with the the, the leader bike team, the the 19 year old guys out here doing it, you know, they've got a, a lifetime of memories now. And even though they didn't set a record, I bet that they look back on this with with a lot of clarity of what happened and a lot of great memories for years to come. You juxtapose the 19 year olds with Dr. Ron Bell someone from 19 to age 70, and, and Dr. Bell has been so important to Ram. How does it strike you as race director to see that demographic variety from a 19-year-old to a 70-year-old competitor? I think what comes to mind is a lot of us like challenges in our lives. We, we strive for that, and uh, no matter how easy our lives have been, how much money we've made, um, how great everything is, you still want to have challenges. And for the Race Across America, that's, that's a goal for a lot of people. And that's, I think, what, what makes it so appealing. When we come back, we'll look at the future of ultra marathon cycling and the future of Race Across America. When Race Across America, the first 20 years returns. Stay with us. 20 years, hundreds of racers, tens of thousands of race miles, and Race Across America continues. And while it's been a lot of fun talking with you, when you look back at the past 20 years as a solo racer, a, a tandem racer, the race director, uh, the husband of a Ram champion, there's got to be a lot of memories that race through your mind. What are some of the most special memories for you? There's, there's thousands of them. Uh, it just uh, in the nights, riding at night, riding all night long, those type of things are as fresh in my mind now as when they happened. Uh, the cattle trucks in Kansas in the middle of the night, the smell of the cattle yards in the middle of the night, uh, the, the thunderstorms, the tornadoes, all the things. Uh, those, I think, are always the fascinating memories I'll, I'll remember the most. Lon, Race Across America is obviously a, a huge operation undertaking each year. What struck me and my film crew this past year was the word family that kind of creeped up. In family, you don't always get along all the time. There's some infighting and some things that go on, but RAM really is something special. Yes, and, and there again, the, the family is, 
is the people involved and uh, you know each not just the riders but the riders will be the first ones to tell you it's it's their crew it's their team it's it's the friends and family who helped them in training even to get to the starting line and then you figure each each rider has a crew of of five to ten to fifteen people or so and you multiply all those people together going across the country so you've got you know several hundred people involved in in the race every year and like you say not they don't always get along but those are the memories of of going to these roadside diners in in the middle of the night uh, going to gas stations you know just the life on the road and I think that's what brings a lot of people back every year as as crew and it's the ultimate road trip and if, if ever you know college students you know going on road trip well that's what RAM is. RAM is a road trip. And uh, it so happens that it's also a competition. But I think so many people enjoy the, the, the fun of going across the country is, what, uh, is why there is such a family of, of RAM participants. Growing excitement continues from corporate sponsors, from individuals and companies that can take part in Race Across America. There's a place for those companies. And, and what do you see the future holds for Race Across America? What would you like to see? Well, you know, RAM is uh, the, the premier cycling um, event in the country. There's, there's nothing like it, uh, you know, coast to coast across the country. You know, this is the, the pioneers in the wagon trains, you know, the American spirit of, of going somewhere. And anybody who's ever been on, um, on a family vacation going across the country, you know, this is, encompasses all of those aspects into uh, a great bicycle race. And for sponsors for the future, you know, to get involved in this. This is uh, the, the grassroots re level of mentality that reaches all people in the United States. They can all relate to going across the United States. And that what makes it such a great uh, sponsorship and corporate tie-in for all the companies to be involved. What would you say to someone serious about being involved with Race Across America, both uh, as a competitor, maybe as an official, or someone that could possibly be on a crew? What would you say to that person? To be on a crew and to be able to help a rider across the country is, is just a, a tremendous, they receive tremendous satisfaction from, from helping people across the country. And as competitors, uh, you know, it's something that gets you out of bed in the morning for a year's worth of training. Uh, because you know if you're not in the best shape you've ever been in your life, you're going to really suffer out there. And it's that type of intensity and commitment that just make it a fascinating uh, event to be involved in. In more than 20 years, the future of Race Across America has never been more bright. Innovative corporations like title sponsor Insight realize the power of RAM and are getting involved. One man with a unique understanding of the future of Race Across America is Jim Petrie, Ram Race Director. The Race Across America is the race of America. It stands for all of the characteristics and strengths of this country. It's endurance, it's the discipline that's required in order to be able to even do it. I'd like to see an, more people understand what the race is about. I often talk to people and talk about this idea of riding a bicycle more or less non-stop across the country and they look at me and they well why would you do a thing like that, you got to be out of your mind. And of course there's some truth in that, but there's another level that we need to get to and it's difficult to convey that if one hasn't actually done it. The heart of Race Across America will always be the solo competition and the classic two and four person team competitions elite individual ultra marathon cyclists in the world's toughest race. New innovations permit others now to share in the magic of RAM. RAM's corporate challenge division is a rare opportunity to build teamwork, company pride, and positive brand exposure. Well, that's part of our, our vision for the future because here we can take people who are more or less average weekend athletes with a bit of training. They're able to come out and participate in this gigantic event. They come back as, as, a, as a changed person that is able to uh, approach and attack their normal day-to-day -day problems with, with a, a different attitude. Tim Crown himself, uh, as CEO, 
has an amazing ability to become enthusiastic about things that he likes and, and he is really excited about Race Across America. But in addition to that, there's a whole group of people within the corporation that are rallying around this event and you see their excitement happen and it becomes a focal point then for the employees of Insight to, to all join into this vision. The current Race Across America course begins in San Diego and finishes in Atlantic City on a famous boardwalk. An opportunity to celebrate the beauty of America along with staggering human achievement. I believe that the human spirit and human life is sacred. And I believe that Race Across America provides an opportunity to examine some of that sacredness because I don't think there's a rider that has participated in Race Across America that at some point in that race has not come to see his maker in some way. That is uh, a great strength of what this is about. New divisions, more competitors, bigger prize awards, all things adding, melding, working together to make Race Across America America's ultimate cycling challenge. The Race Across America will be the Tour de France of America. Race Across America is a celebration of humanity, of the human spirit. For 20 years, it has continued to thrill us, amaze us, and spur us on for something greater in each of us. Lon Haldeman, it's been a pleasure reminiscing with you for the past hour about the history of Race Across America. I look forward to the next show 20 years from now. Are you up for it? Yes. We'll do that tandem. We'll see you in 20.